My sermon this morning is entitled, The Power of Love. And uh, we uh, are using a text from John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. That's a little high on the gain. I'm going to pull that down just a little tad. Okay. A little better now, right? Okay. And um, we are, um, I'm asking Pastor Scott if he will read that text for us. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brother. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. <clears throat> By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for our brother. But whosoever has this world's goods and see his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does he love God? How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, <laughs> let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gives us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abide in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he hath given us. Amen. We live... Still high. Let me take it down just a tad more. We live uh, in a generation that mistakenly believes that love is a three-letter word. And we don't even know what human love is all about. So it stands to reason that we don't have a clue about what God's love is all about. Frankly, I was 31 years old before I experienced God's love in my own life. And it was amazing. It was amazing to me. Um, I was in the middle of a busy day at my shop. I had uh, 12 to 13 employees. And uh, my Greek professor, I was taking a summer class, called me up and he said to me <clears throat> at the end of the conversation, he was exhorting me not to drop out of class because I wasn't doing too well in Koine Greek. Incidentally, after I flunked his class that summer, I took four semesters and did okay. But it was just that first cold water splash. I'd never taken a foreign language in my life. And he finished the conversation by saying, Phil, I believe in you. Don't give up. And he said, Phil, I love you. I sat down so the rest of my employers, employees wouldn't see me weeping. Uh, tears were springing to my eyes. I didn't know what to think about that. <laughs> I was uh, 31 years old, and, and nobody, <clears throat> and I mean nobody, had ever told me. No pastor, no elder, choir member, church member had ever told me that they loved me. And I was absolutely struck by that. This guy, I'd never met him before. He was just out of seminary and just got his uh, doctorate degree in Greek, of course. <laughs> and he tells me, he's a young fellow, he's just newly married, and he tells me that he loves me. Amazing. Now, I had always known human love. A mother's love, devout wife's love, excellent. Wow, first class. Love for my, and by my children, always felt loved by them. And, and loved them with all my heart. Uh, but it's been a glimpse of what I call the divine love 
that Jesus has for you and me personally. It has to be personalized. It's no good to read about it in a book. You have to find it. You have to experience. You have to apprehend it for yourself. A lot of people will quote the Bible verses about God's love, but they don't have a clue about really how much he really does love them. <sighs> you know, I think it's reciprocal. When I finally grasp that, how much he loves you, here's what John said in 1 John 4:19. He said, we love him because he first loved us. Do you know it's irresistible? Remember when you were on a third grade playground and somebody came up and said, you know, Mary Lou really likes you. She has some strong feelings for you. Wow, that was exciting. It was hard not to like her. You know, That's irresistible. It's, it's that way as a child, but it's that way also even more so as an adult. There's, there's great power in Christ's love once you've experienced it. So the sermon today is to explore that love. And, and we're going to ask ourselves the question, what is the power of his love? Is it something that's commercially marketed, like the three-letter word of the porn industry? They market that. They, incidentally, that's one of the chief exports of the United States to the world. Did you know that? Billions of dollars every year go out. And it's just and no wonder they call us the great Satan over there in the Is Islamic countries. Can't say I blame them. Now, can you package love? Can you program it? Or can you put a price? The sermon just explore, explores that powerful uh, love of God. <clears throat> now, uh, as we begin the sermon, you've got the outline in front of you. People who have experienced God's love are not superior to other Christians. God's love in a person's heart does not make them superior. I think it makes them more vulnerable because uh, you know something about a, a heart of flesh as compared with a heart of stone? A heart of flesh can be broken. And, and I'd like to say this. God... Let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart. Amen? Is that a worthy prayer for all of us? Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, Paul put it this way. And incidentally, he was a pro about knowing about the love of God because he's the guy that had persecuted the church of God. And he's the guy that um, wrote the awesome love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Why did he know about that? <laughs> he said, I'm the least of the apostles because I persecuted the church of God. But he says, we know we have, I'm sorry, an eagerly desire, he says, the greater gifts. And now I'll show you the more excellent way. And he goes in then after that uh, passage in 1231 to tell us about the love of God, what it really is. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, it profits me nothing. A sounding gong and a clanging cymbal. You understand? I love it. <laughs> I just love that passage. Every time I read that, think about it, and meditate on it, I'm thinking, yeah. It's love that makes the difference. We have legalistic people all over the world, both Jewish and in every religion, especially we have it, especially in Christianity and the Islamic people. They have literal the law legalist. Where's the love? You know, that's that's the difference. And, and so we know that we have passed said said First John, John the Beloved, twelve. I'm sorry, three and four, fourteen. First John three fourteen. We know we have passed from death and life. Read that with me, will you, please? Because that was the first. Uh, verse of our text today. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He does not love his brother abides in death. And one of the supreme tests of a Christian believer is this. The Bible tells it very clearly. Now, I've listed four beautiful words that are, agape is the highest uh, form of love and this is God's love for man. Then there's phileo. Um, we have... Um, Peter, as God is restoring him, using that word very freely. Lord, you know that I love you like a close family friend. That's phileo. That's what phileo is. Just a close, good friend. And then there's storge. That's family love. Love for father, mother, uh, children. I'm sorry, father, child, child, father, that sort of thing. Family love. <clears throat> and then there's eros. And that's, what, that's the three-letter word for love that our culture seems to be obsessed about. But it's sexual love, and it's usually correctly expressed in marriage. Amen. Now, here's the evidence. There's three things about, the, about love that I want to explore today. And, uh, four things, actually. But the evidence of the power of love. We know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Uh, what we'd say in, in legalistic language would be 
unimpeachable evidence. How many of you watched uh, the OJ trial? A whole year of that soap opera. Well, the trouble is we had impeachable evidence. And every time we turned around, Mark Foreman was getting blown out of the water by some p poor procedure that he, uh, he did not do the crime investigation correctly at all. But unimpeachable evidence is, is that, uh, how in the world would you know that people 2,000 years ago really experienced Jesus Christ? How do you know he lived? I'll tell you what, if someone is willing to lay down their life for someone, for some cause, there has to have been something happen. What would happen just because somebody comes up and tells you, let me tell you a little nice little myth story, mythological story. Would that change your life? No. I'm going to tell you about one of the Greek gods. They're going to change your life? Not a chance. How about a Roman god? They're going to change your life? But Jesus Christ, people were willing to give up what they were doing. Think of Peter out there in the water. He's a fisherman. That's all he knows how to do. Jesus, I'm going to, I'm going to make you fisher of men. Actually, He's, what he actually says, the Greek language is beautiful. He says, I'm, from now on, you're going to be catching men alive. <laughs> You've been catching a lot of dead fish. But you're going to catch men alive. You ever seen the gill net fishermen? They catch dead fish. You know, they're dead. The minute they get caught in those gills, they, they drown. They, they die. But uh, catching men alive, you know, that's exciting. <laughs> they're going to live after you catch them. <laughs> in fact, they're going to live much better. <laughs> Amen. We love fellow believers. That's one of the, one of the unimpeachable evidences. In the Roman uh, century, uh, he was a Jewish writer, but he, he lived. In, he was a Roman, uh, just like Paul was, Roman but Jewish uh, historian. His name was Josephus, and he writes. He's one of the most authentic uh, writers of the time. That they verify a lot of Christian teaching. Uh, he says, "See how they loved one another." He's talking about Christians. He said also, "See how they lay down their lives for each other." Wow. Now, that was how the earliest believers acted. To me, that's the way we still act if we love Jesus and if we've really met him and found his love. You see, in the Roman culture, it was just the opposite. They hated each other. And that sounds like the secular culture of this country. <laughs> you know? and, and then the, uh, the Roman culture, they murdered each other. Hmm. <laughs> now, they're roadblocks-loving people back then and now. Mm -hmm. Hostility, resentment. Uh, it's a political, I think they call it, the political people are calling it class warfare. Let's divide up the country and have them fighting each other. That doesn't make any sense to me. Jealousy and hatred. You know, well, you don't, you got something I don't have. Wow, I didn't have that. I don't have a car like that. Oh, I can't, be, I can't live in peace until I have a, a van like Dan Law has. He got a new van. I can't, I can't live in peace because I, I, I'm not as good as him. You know, craziness. That's insanity. It's, 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 it's insanity. It's a, that's a culture we live in. There is murder in anger. That's what verse 15 says. Let's read that together. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Okay. Now, harboring ang anger, that person that holds on to it, that nurses it, especially against his brother, Christian brother, that person is in danger of hellfire. It's a danger to your spiritual life because it cuts you off from God. Now, here's something that's interesting. Now, understand, it was 1611, and we had um, King James, who commissions these uh, beautiful scholars in his time to take the oldest manuscripts they had and translate the King James Bible. Okay? Now, he had one problem. King James was an intemperate man. <laughs> he was tend to blow his top. And bad things happened when he blew his top. Now, they had a problem. The translators, the Greek and Hebrew scholars, when they came to this passage, they had a problem. Because it says, whoever is angry with his brother, period. There is no without a cause added in there. It's not there. Take a look at the oldest manuscripts. Hmm? But you see, the king's anger is justified because he has a cause. I'm being sarcastic because I don't believe that anybody has the right to do that. But they had to do that or they wouldn't get to publish the Bible. You see, it was a concession to King James. Um, sorry for people that believe that King James is the only authorized correct translation because it does have a few little glitches here and there. If you look at, we even today can check out the older manuscripts that are still existing. Some three, four hundred years later, we can still check and find out that that phrase is not there. But here's what Jesus said. And I'll show you where it, I'm to put it in parentheses because I'm not going to read it. 
You have heard it said from those of old, you shall not murder, and whosoever murders shall be in danger of a judgment. But, but I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother, excluded, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Racha, shall be in danger of the council. And whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Wow. Is, is, are people important to God? Hope to believe it. How do we have the audacity to be angry at people that he loves? See, I just, we, have to, we have to have people pray for us when we get that anger on us like that. Evidence for the power of love, then, is really the ability to witness. Yes, sir. Same thing. It's the same thing of uh, calling them a foolish person or an insignificant person or a worthless person. The good question, though. Thank you. Uh, t page 2, it says, it's, we're quoting Acts 1.8. Read that with me, please. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, here's an interesting take on this. Um, and, and some of you bear with me because I've told you this before. But the word witness here, uh, the actual Greek word, you're going to understand it the minute I say it. Martyrios. Martyr. Now, here's what he's saying. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you're going to give the testimony of Jesus Christ and his great love to the point of laying down your life for death. Now, listen, folks. This kind of, I get kind of emotional thinking about this. We have people in Iran, Iraq, and over in, in, in what is it, Syria, that are doing that right now. They're told, renounce Jesus or your life. And they kneel and say, cut right here. I'm serious. These are people who are willing to take the sword. You know? They have to, they think of it. I, I, it's, my mind just can't wrap it around. You're giving up your child to the sword because you won't renounce your faith in Jesus. That's what they, these monsters have people do. Pouring gasoline on people and lighting them up? Ooh. That just makes you shudder. Okay. Now, is Jesus present in that? Listen. He never takes you any place. He doesn't show up and take you through. He doesn't take you into tribulation. He takes you through tribulation. Don't forget it. We can only see one side of the door that these people are passing through. But I'm going to tell you, there is great fanfare in heaven for each one of these folks that are laying down their lives because of their faith in Christ and their love for him. Power to give testimony to the point of death. No, we don't. No. There's so much toleration and we have so many people that are, are spoiled. Uh, idiots. I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Unlearned people. <laughs> actually, that's another, that's another Greek word. Idiotes is actually a Greek word. Is that Latin too? Is that? I'm not sure about Latin. But the idiotes, they, they actually translate it nicely saying unlearned men. <laughs> okay, number two point. First of all, there was the evidence of the power of love. Now there, there's the action of the power of love. Verse 16. Together, read that with me, please. By this we know that love because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, the agape itself, this kind of God's love in us, uh, it, it acts out by giving. We give. Um, God loved so much, he, what did he do? He gave. He gave. He, so, <clears throat> Revelation, listen now. Whenever God reveals something to you, you always have to respond to it. You can't take that hot potato that God puts in your heart and in life and say, what am I going to do with this? Oh, the preacher gave it to him. I'll give it back to him. Come on, you can't do that. It's the Word of God. And hopefully I'm preaching and teaching the Word of God and not my own opinions about things. So you get the idea that it's him talking. Here's what he would be saying. Don't just stand there. Do something. <laughs> Find somebody to love and love them. And incidentally, let's do it. I, I just love the um, founder of the William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army. He said... Go after sinners and find them and make it the worst. <laughs> and that's what he did. He led them to Christ. He, he found the people that were open. Who, who, knows, who knows about the need for Christ? Broken people. But you go to uh, the Fat Cats in the First Church of uh, Opulence down there in downtown somewhere. They're not gonna, they don't need Christ. You know, they're good people. They just go there to rehearse their goodness on Sunday morning. I'm sorry. I'm picking on them. I don't mean to. Uh, I, lo I love them, too. I love the fact that some of them are real good gospel preachers. God bless them. 
Faith alone without action is dead. That's what James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in James 2.17. Read that with me, please. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now I want you to know if you read this passage, it says it three times. This is just one of the three times. Now if the Bible says something once, it's important. If he says it twice, it's really important. If he says it three times, underscore it and put it in the back of your mind and do, it, do something, act on it. We ought to, we lay down our lives for one another. And, and here's what God, uh, Jesus said in John 15, 13. Greater love is no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Amen. So believers act out their love for one another. We do something. We don't just say be filled and be, be, uh, be clothed. We actually do the filling and the clothing. and We do what we can because that's why Christianity operates. So Jesus set it for an example for us of self-sacrifice. In 1 John 3.16. By this we know love. That's agape, incidentally. That's the word agape here. Because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Amen. Evidence of the power of love is action. <laughs> for 22 uh, years, I'm, I'm not trying to be a martyr myself here, so don't, don't misunderstand me. Lois and I have given up our weekends to hold parties for the sheepfold friends. And uh, gradually we had to give up about to where we started out with about eight to ten and we're down to about five or six a year because we just physically can't do what we used to do when we were, we were younger. But um, it's all we can do. But maybe in the future some of you may catch the spirit and say, Pastor, what can I do? I'd like to kind of help and fill in for some of these parties and help you out. And boy, today we, was a good example of that. We had such cooperation. Amazing. Wow. Amazing. Point three. There's the, first there is the power of love and, and evidence of, and then there's the action of, and now the origin of. And, and verse 23 of our text, and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son, of Christ, uh, G, uh, the Son Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So Jesus Christ is the origin of God's love. We never knew love until incarnation that happened there in that little stable in Bethlehem. We didn't really know love until then. <clears throat> it was birthed at Calvary too. It may have had its origins there in that little stable, but it was it was really birthed on the cross. That's what the word Calvary means, cross. It's a place of the skull there in Jerusalem. His cross is love in action. Romans 5, 8, would you read this with me please? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amazing. I'd rather find some good people to die for, not some of these skunks I see in this culture around us. But he was willing to do it for them. The essence of the gospel is love and action. Amen. Now, responding to Jesus' love is as easy as ABC. Now, I'm going to tell you something really honest now. I'm being honest. I stole this from the Salvation Army. <laughs> ABC is the plan of salvation with the, with the Army people. If you ever listen to it, it's really beautiful. Uh, first of all, accept. Open your heart to Jesus and invite him in. Accept. Believe. Believe on the name. Nor I love this. And, uh, that's verse 23 and then Acts 4.12. Uh, our text in 23, the first half of the verse is believe on the name. And then Acts 4.12 says, nor, read that with me. That's so good. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men. By which we must be saved. Amen. And then finally, A, B, accept, believe, and finally, commit. Psalm 37, 5. I'll, I'll, I'll just read this one. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Amen. Commit. You've got to do something. Last page. Then there's the sharing of the power of love. In Romans 1, 16. Oh, I love that passage. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. Thank God for the Greek, because <laughs> that's where we come in. <laughs> power of love is found in the sharing of the gospel message by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of people that do medical good things in foreign countries. A lot of people, some of these nurses and caretakers have been losing their life over there. Because these people, they consider them, them as dangerous as a person with a bullet. Did you know that? It's dangerous to the, to the Islamic faith 
Because if they see Christians doing things that Muslims can't do or won't do, then that's kind of scary for them. So they just, just kill us. Just, you know, take off our heads. Make us bleed. Okay. Here's, uh, we share this gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not just sharing it by yourself. He's present. And then sharing this kind of power is expensive. And, and this uh, love, this kind of love we're talking about, this agape, is God's pearl of great price. He talks about that. You know, the kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price. That a man finds a pearl and sells everything he has to get it. Okay. It just leaves it there. That's the way the story is. I want to tell you the man, a, a, a story about the man who really found the great pearl that he had spent a whole lifetime searching for. He had looked everywhere. He had been to the Orient from one end to the next. He had looked everywhere to find the special pearl. And they were, he had little special micrometers to measure the size. And they were all pretty nice. Not the great one. Until one day he finds it. And some little obscure pearl drive, diver happened to open up a certain little bit of, of the, this crustacean. And there is that pearl. It was triple the size of anything he'd ever seen. He was absolutely filled with this longing when he saw it. And he asked the, the, the person who had found it what he would take for it. He said, well, sir, I don't have much. He says, uh, so you have a whole lot. You have much. So what would you give up for it? And he said, well, I have a bank account. I have $100,000 in my IRA. He said, the man that uh, found the pearl said, I'll take that. <laughs> then he says, well, at least I've, I've got my, um, my personal savings. He says, I'll take that too. Still, the guy wanted it. He wanted his pearl. He wanted that pearl at great price because it was just such a, he had searched his whole life to find it. And this was going to fulfill this great need in his life. And finally, he says, well, at least I got a nice home at, and, and I'll, I'll be able to enjoy that. And he said, I'll take that. You know where this is going, don't you? And he says, well, at least I got a wife and children. He says, I'll take them. Well, I got a cabin up in the mountains. I'll take that. And the guy is really starting to get heavy hearted. The cost of this great pearl of great price is taking everything he has. And he says, sir, you have everything but the shirt on my back. He's very sad. And, and uh, he starts to walk away. He's got the pearl in his hand. But somehow he has a heavy heart and disappointment he didn't know he was going to have. Because he has the, the thing his heart has always longed for. But yet, this, something is wrong. And so he's heavy hearted. He starts to walk away. And the man says, oh, by the way, I don't need a $100,000 IRA. I'm going to loan it to you. I want to make sure that you take good care of it, though, because it won't help me out here fishing, this little fishing village I live in. And he says, I'm going to loan that to you. And he says, oh, the, the house that you live in? I don't need that either. I'm going to let you continue to live there with my permission. And then he goes a little further and he says, I'll take those that wife and children. I'll give them back to you. But their own loan. The cabin in the woods, I'll take that. Your bank accounts, your credit cards, I'll take them. No, I'll give them back. But their only own loan. They're not yours. We used to sing a song when I was a little kid in the Baptist church. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. So the man with the pearl of great price found out that to get the great pearl, he just had to t turn everything over to the one who was greater than he was. And, and you understand, that's the commitment to Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. That's the gospel in essence, is that nothing, nothing we have, none of this, we're going to lose all of this when we leave this earth. Nothing is, is permanent in, in around us, but he is permanent. And the people we love with his love, that's permanent. Father in heaven, we ask your blessing on this message we've given about the power of love. And this awesome agape love, Father, every time I approach this subject, I come away saying, well, I did close, but I didn't quite do it, Lord. But Lord, I pray that today you'll open hearts and hearts and minds to the fact that your love is very personal with them that you care about each person in the sound of my voice this day in a very special way. We love you, Jesus, and offer this prayer in your name. Amen.